Respondents were asked to indicate the top five most pressing issues faced by communities with issues including affordable housing, economic development, safety and justice, health and capacity building, among other. I think there were 11 in total. Um, and we should note that the survey was shared just before the COVID pandemic and prior to the George Floyd murder and social uprisings. So we can't be certain if that would have imp impacted the number um, of respondents listing health and safety and justice as the most critical. Um, but of the responses we received, nearly half of respondents listed affordable housing as the most critical issue area facing their communities. And 81% listed affordable housing as one of the top five most critical issue areas facing their communities. And the full breakdown um, is available in the report, which will circulate after this call if you haven't already had a chance to see it. We also received over 400 examples of policies and programs spanning the breadth of community development work, but with the majority of examples focused on housing or more specifically housing policies really aimed at preserving existing affordable homes, developing new affordable housing, reducing the rate racial disparity in home ownership and tenant and renter protections and other anti-displacement tools. Uh, so with that, I'll pass things over to my colleague and co-author on um, this brief, Michelle Harati, who's gonna dig a little bit uh, more deeply into some of the policies that we received and that were shared um, by respondents. Michelle, I'll pass things over to you. Thanks, Sarah. So as we've been discussing, our report up, uplifts policies that were shared by respondents that are working to undo the impacts of historical discrimination and government actions that undermine black and brown individuals' opportunities to own a home and build wealth within their communities. So in addition to TOPA, which we'll discuss in a moment, respondents shared examples of other housing policies that address challenges tied to new production, zoning and land use, outstanding housing voucher needs and discrimination, amongst others. Potential solutions to each of these challenges are discussed in the report, and I'm going to highlight a few local replicable innovations with promising results. The first of which is tied to strategies for new production. So this includes inclusionary zoning programs that link the ability to develop new market rate units with the mandate to create affordable units or offer developers incentives to do so. Many cities, as I'm sure you're all familiar, particularly those experiencing rapid growth and a high demand for housing are implementing inclusionary zoning ordinances that require developers to set aside a percentage of all units as affordable. Although despite the success, 22 states across the country have enacted laws that limit the ability of cities to enact these policies and eight states have preemptive laws that expressly prohibit it. Our respondents recognize the critical role that these exclusionary or inclusionary zoning ordinances can play in facilitating or hindering access to opportunity and in some cases that this will need legislative reform at the state level to ensure that inclusionary zoning is a tool that's available to in all markets we also heard from respondents that innovations in the use of voucher programs are key to helping families earning low wages secure affordable housing for instance, the city of Denver partnered with public and private partners, including LISC, to develop the Lower Income Voucher Equity Program, or Live Denver, uh, to connect vacant rental units to working families and individuals who'd been previously unable to find adequate housing through the incorporation of financial coaching and additional subsidy to layer on to their voucher to help down, buy down the rents and vacant market rate apartments. And we've also received a number of responses that pointed to source of income protections as a critical tool to advance fair housing practices. Source of income ordinances protect tenants from landlords refusing to rent to otherwise eligible applicants simply because of their status as voucher holders. And these are valuable protections as income discrimination undermines the use of vouchers and is tied to the development of racially segregated communities and concentrated poverty. These new ordinances can protect those who've been awarded vouchers and other forms of housing subsidy from discrimination in the private housing market. And studies have found that these laws can make a substantial difference in the rate of voucher utilization and helping prompt neighborhood choice. And finally, respondents also provided insights and shared examples of inclusive economic development programs and policies focused on wealth building, career development, entrepreneurship, and micro business initiatives as well as neighborhood focused programs that bolster local districts and create living wage jobs. We encourage you to review these findings in the complete report. And I'll now hand it back to Sarah to provide some further background on today's webinar top, topic, TOPA. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so as Michelle noted, we're really excited today to be doing a deeper dive into one of the policies that was lifted up in the report um, and the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act or TOPA policy 
which has been used in, in DC as a tool to create home ownership opportunities for like and see residents in DC um, and in, in historically black neighborhoods, many of which have seen over the past several years skyrocketing home and rental values. So TOPA was introduced in, in DC in 1980 and assists residents threatened with displacement due to, the, due to the sale of their building by offering them the first opportunity to purchase if the owner is planning on selling, demolishing, or discontinuing use as a rental um, building. This has been a powerful tool for affordable housing preservation in DC and has been used to convert approximately 100 buildings or 4,000 affordable cooperative units since being introduced. And although many of the units have been transitioned into limited equity cooperative ownership, we really want to emphasize, I think it's really important that the decision is left to the tenants on how they want to exercise their TOPA rights. If they want to purchase their building or assign their rights to a developer, they can do that. And whether they want to establish a limited equity cooperative or go market rate or condominium, really the tenants are provided with the agency to make that decision for themselves. And as Julia noted, our panelists in DC, some of whom have been implementing TOPA in, in DC for decades, we'll share shortly, a robust ecosystem has developed over these past years to support tenants as they transition their buildings, including an extensive network of tenant organizers, legal service providers, financing partners, nonprofit developers, and city partners, which are all have all been critical to the program's success and an important consideration today as policies like these continue to gain momentum around the country. And we're also going to hear from panelists in New York about recent advocacy efforts to introduce TOPA as well as a complement community opportunity to purchase or COPA, which would allow qualified nonprofits to make the first offer to purchase a building with low income tenants if the property owner decides to sell. COPA and TOPA offer solutions to preserving affordability in neighborhoods that are rapidly becoming more expensive while also providing a clear pathway to ownership for legacy res residents and communities of color. And as evidence in this, the response to our survey, increasing affordable housing continues to be a top priority for community development practitioners, philanthropists, governments, and residents, among others. And it is clear today, as we're bracing for another possible foreclosure and eviction crisis, why policies like TOPA and COPA, which make tenants less vulnerable to these speculative land grabs, are so critical, and why housing advocates and policymakers in cities across the country, including Berkeley, Oakland, Los Angeles, Twin Cities, Boston, Atlanta recently, and New York are calling for the introduction of TOPA and COPA legislation. So with that, I'll hand things back over to Julia to introduce our first panelist. Thanks everyone. Um, thanks, Sarah. And I just wanna make sure the slides are advancing correctly. Oops, sorry. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. No, no worries. I just want to make sure we, we can get to Fernando's slides too. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very excited uh, to introduce um, our first speaker, Fernando Lemos, uh, the executive director of Mi Casa. Um, and in addition to, and uh, Fernando has um, over 35 years of experience in nonprofit and economic development um, in DC, including um, implementing TOFA. Um, so Fernando, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, as you know, at, um, I'm Fernando Lemos and started uh, Mi Casa 30 years ago in order to organize and protect the tenants in DC. Now, I will talk a little bit about uh, TOPA. TOPA was created basically in the 1970s in order to, uh, when happened was because the DC government started to take control of the, the uh, uh, destiny. So, in order to maintain and, and create a uh, uh, is, is system that protects the existing residents more of their minority, the government in DC implemented the TOPA right and given the opportunity to the tenants to uh, uh, exercise the right to purchase the property. That was a, a critical moment in our history because at that moment, we have the opportunity to the transition from the federal government to oversight DC government uh, was changing and the DC government was able to produce the law that created TOPA. And at that moment, uh, a group of people get together and they start to organize the tenants to exercise the right. And uh, that, the, uh, that moment was critical because through that TOPA, we were able uh, to maintain affordable housing in the district. Um, it's interesting, uh, 
to top, uh, they never define the type of ownership that you want to exercise at a tenant. It's much more than anything define your right as a tenant. And that is the elements that uh, motivated the organizations to maintain. Now, during that process, uh, also we have to look at that in a very uh, integral uh, system in which where um, DC government was able to assist the tenant financially, as well as an other entity like a list and private banks provide assistance to the tenants in order to maintain affordability in the buildings. That was very crucial at that moment. And, uh, and that was a, a moment of transition. Now, TOPA, also not only protects the tenants, you know, also was an, an elements that create a community because through the exercise of ownership, the individuals start to organize themselves and created institutions that will run their buildings and they empower the people. And that was one of the key things during the uh, transition in the government because they want to empower the community as well. And that was an element that TOPA was addressing in that moment. Uh, I think it's, it's important to analyze that during that um, um, moment of empowering the community, that the community was in, in, the, in, in, uh, in transition of changing because at that time, not only the government was changing, you know, also the community was changing. We have a, a, a major migration of immigrants from uh, Latin America was coming in the District of Columbia and TOPA helped them, uh, and they were able to develop a housing now. The only things that we have to analyze that TOPA is not only for multifamily, TOPA also is protecting individuals who rent single houses and they can be exercise the right to purchase the home if the home is for sale or anyway. Well, that's the history of TOPA. Now, because I was able to develop during that process, uh, you know, we developed co-ops in a many, in a, many uh, opportunities. And one of the things that is very crucial for us is to educate the tenants to understand their right and to develop the capacity to and empower the tenants as an owner. So we assist the tenants to develop their capacities to become more and become owners and understand the system of administrating the properties and oversight the, the, the um, oversight the management companies and, and, and basically became, you know, uh, self, uh, empowered themselves. Well, that's my, basically is my presentation about TOPA history. If you. Great. Thank you, uh, Fernando. Um, and I'm getting a couple questions um, that, that I'll see for the discussion as well. Um, so, so next we're going to hear um, from Tanya Jackson. And Tanya is currently the Chief of Staff for DC Council Member Brianne K. Nadeau. Um, and in addition to being a longtime TOPA advocate, uh, she also lives in a housing co-op created uh, through TOPA. Um, so the floor is yours, Tanya. Hello, um, so happy to be going uh, after Fernando, who has such a long, deep history in this. Um, there are a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. First of all, um, we have had TOPA since, you know, it was conceived of in the 70s. It was enacted by the council in the 80s. I think the thing that everybody needs to understand nationally, and the thing that I will always say until we get statehood, is that DC does not have statehood. We don't have the right to govern ourselves completely. We are second class citizens in the United States. So we got home rule in 1974. The people who took over our government were all people who had graduated from the civil rights movement and came to Washington, D.C. to help us be more free. Um, so we had a bunch of people who decided to dream a whole new world in Technicolor. And there were people like Fernando who said, 
Um, how do we make sure that more people participate and more people have access to wealth and more people have the ability to take control of their destiny? And knowing that Washington, D.C. was chocolate city then and became, as Fernando said, a city that also welcomed a great deal of migration from Central America, we realized that the people who really needed to be solved for in our city government needed us to have the right intention and the intention was to empower them. So. Um, TOPA's enactment, in addition to allowing a lot of communities that were underserved to access home ownership in a totally different way, also gave people power in a whole new process where they actually had to make these decisions. As Fernando said, it defined your right. It didn't define what you had to do in terms of purchase. So we have a lot of black and brown home ownership that happened because people thinking creatively about how to use this tool. We have um, a hybrid co-op condo in Mount Pleasant that is largely Latino home ownership um, that exists because a bunch of these minds got together and tried to figure out how to not only save the building, but save the people who live in the building. We have a very robust um, and multi-representational nonprofit community that includes developers and community-based organizations that have created these um, these these buildings and I live, for example, in a very small building. It's a 15 unit cooperative, but at the point that I became development consultant on the project, it was 75% senior citizen, all low income, all people who had lived in this neighborhood for more than uh, 30 years. There were people who had moved. There was the man who lived underneath me was the very first tenant in the building in 1955 and was very proud of the fact that he was able to applied to live in the building as an African American in a city that was segregated and was allowed to actually have the opportunity to rent here. He never imagined that he would have the opportunity to buy. And that's what Topa has sort of enlarged um, for the totality of the city. The possibilities have become endless. So we have hybridized co-ops, we have low, we have limited equity co-ops that are limited along all the spectrum. Um, we have we have condos that have been created that are affordable condominium associations, and we have affordable rental where people have had the opportunity to partner with uh, larger nonprofits that have helped keep the costs low. And the net effect has been that black and brown people have been able to stay in the city, which in recent years have really, really, really has experienced an incredible amount of gentrification. And uh, this has become an important tool. I think. The, the thing on the city side that has been um, really important is putting our money where our mouth is and the, uh, the ongoing support that's required in cities is for the organizations that do the work. Um, it's for the funding to help figure out how to get people into these buildings. And it's also for the actual residents of the properties. Um, cities need to have mechanisms where they actually help people understand what the process is. So in the district, the government actually works hand in hand with the nonprofits. When the notices are delivered, um, there are several nonprofits that are alerted that there's a possibility that this building will come up for sale and a bunch of people are released into that community immediately to work with the tenants to come up with the best solution for that property. Um, and I think that that has been one of the most important things about this. We figured out ways to actually honor the individuals and in neighborhoods and help them come to the right conclusion for themselves. Um, and that's a big part of what I think everybody should be seeking as we talk about um, justice uh, through policy making, equity through policy making. It's actually empowering individuals to make decisions that are beneficial for themselves. And it doesn't start without intentionality. Everyone has to be on board with the idea that they're coming up with a plan to actually help people do the thing that they need to do. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to say is, um, so Fernando pointed out that we used to have single family topa for single family houses and unfortunately recently the city council actually um, went along with my boss was not one of the people she kind of fought tooth and nail against this but recently we eliminated single family topa which I think is going to be absolutely detrimental in a city that is mostly zoned for single family housing and is um, the biggest issue sort of facing us um, I think in cities in general is thinking about how we can empower people to purchase single family homes too, 
or how we can think differently about single family home ownership. And I'm really sorry that that tool has gone away for uh, residents of the district, but the multifamily component is still a robust, a robust tool. And it's one that we continue to invest in. I would say the two of the most important things that cities need to think about is how to fund in perpetuity uh, supports for these buildings. The community based organizations that do the housing counseling work, like Mikasa and housing counseling services and LEDC and a bunch of the organizations that actually support the people. That's how we get these um, legacy properties to last for a long time. We've got co ops that have been around for 30 years and it's because community based organizations exist and people can go there before there's a major crisis and say, hey, we're having a problem and they can come in and help fix it. Um, so there has to be a serious set of intentionality around what it is that we want to do and how we're going to get there. And there's a lot to learn from the DC landscape. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, and so to round out the DC portion um, of the discussion, uh, we're going to pass the mic to Ramon Jacobson, uh, who's the executive director of LISC's DC office, um, which is a TOPA lender and partner. I mean, the microphone is hot. That was uh, some fire that was being being shared right there, especially around the statehood issue. Uh, you all who have senators, you can make those phone calls. Um, but of course, we're not a lobbying organization, but I'm just suggesting. Um, so thanks. I mean, this is great to to, to follow um, Fernando, who's got this great legacy and, and Tanya, this deep um, history of advocating for TOPA. Um, so I, I think not exactly clear on where we are with level setting, so I'll do a little of that, but um, I guess I would frame TOPA in DC with two sort of uh, theoretical sides. There's the right to match the purchase offer, and then there's the opportunity. And, um, you know, DC has had the right for a long time, but we were a shrinking city for um, 40 years, losing about 60,000 people every 10 years up until about 2003. When things really whiplashed, and 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 so DC's market changed as well. But for years we had a right, um, and then we had real estate that was declining in value every year. Um, so we didn't also have a lot of public dollars. And now we have public dollars, but we have high, very expensive real estate. So it's always a challenge to make those two pieces come together. Um, and I think one of the things that um, is really interesting in the history side is that um, that self-determination piece, which was really a strong theme in the 70s, has carried through 40 years later in the TOPA, in the support for TOPA. Um, really, it's about people controlling their destiny. It's about the, the fundamentals of community development, of engaging communities and finding out where they stand um, and working collectively. So, um, you know, for us, this is at the center of what we would, what we were just a few years ago calling equitable development, and I think now um, leans into that racial equity space as well. Um, really, where it's um, putting, you know, what it answers sort of this theoretical question is, what kind of housing would you develop if residents were in the driver's seat, right? And in our industry, I know there's a lot of housing nerds on here with finance backgrounds, not unlike myself, where you know we're looking, we look at efficient models. But we also need to understand that the fabric of, of our communities is often in smaller buildings um, where we can't use a tax credit and an outside investor, but we need to have sort of a, a, a both and all um, tools mentality at the moment. So when we put the tenants in, in, the, in the driver's seat, and I know this having worked with Fernando, was they would find, they would see opportunities where other people didn't. So there would be tenant associations that would be formed and you'd say, you know, you talk to them about how you're going to buy their building, but then you'd sit down with them longer and they'd say, literally, my brothers and I broke into the building when it was boarded up. We fixed up some units. We went to the landlord and we said, if you're going to sell the building, sell it to us and we'll fix it up. You know, that happened and those buildings became affordable housing that still exists in high income areas today. Um, we, you know, I remember a project with uh, that Fernando said, you know, it's it's about eight hundred thousand dollars, and it didn't appraise for that much money. But they could see that the neighborhood was changing, um, and some of those people, are, I think, what informs our commitment to this strategy is that these are the people who literally fought for the neighborhood to improve and become livable, and we need to have a tool to keep them in place as it's changed. 
Um, and even though DC has neighborhoods that are resemble New York York City or, or San Francisco, it has other neighborhoods that are still in that disinvestment stage. Um, and it's the value that they bring forth that that we recognize. So let me do a little bit of level setting with Topa, right? In DC. Building goes for sale. You're going to sell it to the, the landlord, the owner, it's going to sell it to a third party. Tenants match the price. So that's key to understand, right? The tenants, the, the seller's going to get the same dollar amount, whether he sells it to the tenants or this third party. The tenants have, they organize, they get support from some of these community groups that um, were mentioned. You know, we got to have these community groups at the early stage to help them walk through their legal rights. And then how do you form an, a, an association that can pursue it? So we help with su supporting some of those organizations, as does DC government. Um, and there's some legal firms that do pro bono work to get through that. Like what it, we have a tenant association that wants to look at this, right? Then there's a financial piece, right? They've got to see what, how much does it cost? How much is, how much money can we compile in private debt with some subsidy dollars? And do we need to do a renovation? And that's where Mikasa comes in, like the development consultant. Um, and other nonprofits, and sometimes some for profits and people who do it as a specialty line of work as well. And they will help guide the organization to buying the building and usually to renovating it. And that means they're also bringing in the subsidy dollars. And so, um, you know, DC government has dollars available, but like any government, it's hard to move at this quick pace of getting all your red tape um, tied up and squared away. And so that's where CDFI step in. Um, so those, that's kind of how Topa works. So that's, those are the kind of critical pieces. So you understand that. And um, I think we can post a, a couple of things that might help lay that out. Um, in terms of the ecosystem of what we as a, as an organization think is important is it's, it, it's the upfront support for the organization. So they're present when the opportunities happen. Um, it's little bits of capital at earnest money deposit, um, a pre-development, you know, due diligence investment, and then some acquisition financing. And then perhaps, you know, they want to, uh, a role for construction financing or permanent financing, but often it's um, our affiliate. We have an affiliate as others as well, the National Equity Fund, which is invests in if they decide to go tax credit. So there we got, we got all the ecosystem pieces. You need to have a robust public sector dollars to make it reality if you're an expensive city in particular. Um, on the development pass, I want to, I want to just bring that forth because Sarah mentioned it, right? So. The tenants can buy it themselves. They can go cooperative usually, or they can do a condo association. More, most recently, it's been more cooperatives. It can be a limited equity cooperative. That can mean basically full limited equity or can have some kind of appreciation in the share price. Condos, you know, it can be some kind of mix of affordability. Usually if we're involved, it's, it's gonna be some affordability. And then the other thing they can do is if it's a bigger project, if it's gonna need more complex financing, they, they, in that before acquisition is done, they assign their rights to a partner, usually a nonprofit, some kind of nonprofit, to buy the building and renovate it on their behalf. So Mikasa is doing that with two projects in in um, Greater Anacostia, let's say, um, in in Ward Eight, which is a um, sort of the less uh, wealthy section of DC, where Mikasa is working with the tenants, but is becoming the owner. Um, so those two paths give the, give ten, it keeps tenants in the driver's seat, but they actually have it's their agent who is then carrying forth the development plan. So for us, you know, this is a, a this is a really valuable tool. I think on a personal level, all our staff. I mean, it's it's you're meeting with people in laundry rooms. I know that the that Fernando and his team would do that more extensively than than any any of us do, but. We get direct insight into the lives of the um, the residents, and we learn things about them. The first the cover slide that was shared on the presentation is from a project that was that Mikasa was the development consultant for the Claiborne Cooperative, or I think that's the one. It's, it was directly across from my house at the time it was done. Um, and though I knew people very briefly, it was under it was through the Topa process that I got to hear their story. You know, and many of those folks who lived in that building were immigrants from Chile in 1973. So they came here before there was a Topa statute. And they, by the time he started working with them, they'd lived in the building for 30, more than 35 years. For them, this was their permanent home. But the, the, the things that they had worked together to support each other over that period were the foundation of, for, the, for the cooperative that was formed with a, with a host of new residents over time. 
and it really contributed to the long term affordability, but also the social fabric of the community and the building. So let me leave it there and we'll can trans transition to the New York. Uh, update. Uh, thank you so much, Ramon. Um, so now we're, yeah, we're going to hear um, the latest on current New York efforts to pass TOPA and COPA. Um, so um, next we're going to Celeste Hornbach, the Housing and Policy Director at the Mutual Housing Association of New York, um, and Akila Brown, a SCADA Legal Fellow at New Economy Project, um, who have both been deeply involved in shaping TOPA and COPA legislation and advocacy efforts, um, including through their work with the Housing Justice for All and New York City Community Land Initiative Coalitions. Thanks, Julia. Um, as you mentioned, I, I'm a legal fellow and I work specifically with community land trusts in New York City. Um, with the New Economy Project, we are essentially an organization fighting for financial and economic justice. Uh, we, we work on issues ranging from predatory lending to debt collection, to abusive debt collection, to advancing community land trusts or CLTs, worker co-ops, public banking. Essentially, we work on challenging systems um, that harm and extract wealth from communities of color, but we also work to advance community-led development. Specifically with our CLT work, um, we help to convene the New York City Community Land Initiative, which you see on the slide, um, which is a coalition of groups and advocates, including Northwest Bronx Community Clergy Coalition, we will hear from in a second, um, that's working to promote CLTs in New York City based on the understanding that housing is a human right and that communities that are most affected should be the ones leading the way forward. Um, so why TOPA for the coalition? Um, we, well, I'm gonna actually say, use the term opportunity to purchase, and I think Celeste will too, to cover both TOPA and COPA, um, but we're looking at it as one, not the only, but one necessary tool to stabilize neighborhoods, preserve affordable housing and create shared equity through communities taking collective control over their buildings. Um, nicely, the coalition, um, nicely members not only recognize um, opportunity to purchase as a strategy for intervening in a highly speculative market, um, but they also see it as a tool to bring properties into social ownership. Um, and really, and what's been echoed by our DC panelists is the importance of a right that's centered in agency and empowerment. You know, before a building goes to market, those that are living there should have the first say or pass on that transaction. Um, we're also working with Housing Justice for All, which Celeste will discuss. Um, yeah, so I, I actually thought it would be helpful here to, to talk a little bit about uh, an example building in, in New York um, over the last 10 years. Um, so this is a, a 32 unit building in, in Crown Heights. Um, people in New York and, and maybe others will, will know that this is a, a neighborhood that's rapidly gentrified over the last uh, 15 years. Um, so this building was bought and sold four times in the past 15 years. Um, in 2005, it was sold for a little less than 2 million. And by two, 2016, the fourth sale, um, the building sold for a little under 18 million. Uh, so this translates into an 842% increase in value in 11 years. Um, and a, a 2016 article about the building detailed the extensive efforts by the, the current owner to harass and buy out longer term rent stabilized tenants, largely tenants of color. Um, including withholding heat uh, for multiple winters um, and, and using construction as a, a tactic of harassment. Um, so the, the passage of the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019 um, has hopefully arrested some of this process by removing several of the mechanisms by which landlords could raise rent and remove units from rent regulated buildings. Um, but I just thought it was also interesting to think through um, how TOPA might have intervened in this process, um, both in, in the terms of, of tenants uh, exercising their, their opportunity to purchase, um, but also just as an organizing tool as well to sort of slow the logic of, of these sales. Um, so I think as this has been mentioned a bunch as well, um, we, we all know that the, the goals that, are, that Akila mentioned and that are illustrated on the slides um, can only be achieved if, if the program's properly designed and properly funded. Um, so we, we sort of understand at this moment, uh, we're kind of just in the beginning stages um, in that the, the, the bill is obviously just a legislation. Um, so in the beginning stages of having to, to fight, for, fight for the laws and, and making sure that uh, 
through that process, right, it, it keeps the spirit of, of these five pillars of what we're trying to fight for. And then, you know, to continue to fight for proper implementation and, and adequate funding so that it's not just the opportunity, but actually um, a right that, that tenants are able to, to have. Um, so with that, I'm just going to pass to Akila to talk a little bit about the differences between the TOPA bill, which is at the state level, and, and COPA, which is at the New York City level. Thank you. Um, and thanks for whoever is moving the slides along. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, so yeah, there is two policies that have been two bills that have been introduced, not yet passed. Uh, there's New York State TOPA and there's New York City COPA. Um, there are a few distinctions that I'll cover, but the main ones are that um, TOPA is statewide, while COPA would be specifically in New York City. Um, TOPA gives the primary purchase right to tenants, that's the T in it, and COPA gives um, the primary right, the only right to qualified entities. It's a community opportunity to purchase. Um, as you see in the slide, those qualified entities in COPA would either be CLTs, community land trusts that have received funding to operate um, their CLT program. It could be uh, qualified preservation buyers on our city's housing departments, uh, qualified preservation buyers list that includes both nonprofit and for profit organizations um, for the purpose of acquiring property for affordable housing. Um, or qualified entities can be nonprofits that meet certain criteria, including a commitment to affordable housing for low or moderate income residents, a commitment to community engagement, and a, capac a demonstrated capacity to acquire and manage property. Um, in the statewide TOPA bill, qualified organizations, institutional organizations essentially don't have that same primary right, but they have a secondary right after tenants have either waived their right or assigned that right to that organization. Celeste is gonna talk about just the eligibility under that in a second. Um, but just in terms of thinking about how both were conceptualized, New York State TOPA was conceptualized as a priority largely from the ground, from grassroots groups who spent time thinking through the program that they wanted to see. Um, those pillars that you saw on the previous slide um, is what was what, what the vision was, and that's the policy that was proposed and promoted in partnership with our legislative champion, Senator Myrie and Assembly Member Matanes. Uh, New York City COPA was drafted actually at the council level, um, but many stakeholders have been weighing in and partnering with Council Member Rivera on the legislation, potential amendments, and the resulting program once it passes. Um, in terms of the precedent used, because obviously we're building on work that's already been done, um, New York City COPA is modeled largely on San Francisco's COPA bill, which went into effect in 2019. And just a quick note about financing, I see it coming up in the chat and with others, San Francisco's COPA, um, San Francisco provides most of the financing for COPA purchases and capacity building. So that's an important uh, point. Um, New York State TOPA, on the other hand, builds off of DC's legislation, but it has also largely been informed by the policies we're seeing being introduced across the country, most notably in Berkeley. Um, it's clear that the DC law once combined with strong tenant organizing, strategic partnerships, and social housing models can create and preserve a considerable stock of social housing. We're going to get a lot of that built into the letter of the law from the outset. Um, and in terms of how these work together, both of the bills are complementary. And I think that the bill sponsors would agree that they're not meant to be duplicative, but they're operating within two different political and legal contexts. Um, New York City COPA. And New York City in general has is limited in its scope and ability to reach some of the principles that we discussed uh, for a few reasons. First, New York City is unable to regulate affordability more strictly than the state will allow. Um, there's a law that that limits that um, we're a function of the state. Second, um, I, and I won't get into too much detail about this, but there was a New York City TOPA law that was on the books, um, and it was meant to give tenants an opportunity to purchase when an owner was converting a building out of an affordable housing program, such as like project based section 8 that was actually struck down by the courts because it was held to force an owner's hand in terms of forcing the owner to sell the property. When they may have been just trying to convert the building out of affordable housing, um, 
the courts also held that it was forcing an owner to sell at a price that was set by an appraisal panel instead of the market. So because of that, New York City policy, New York City TOPA policy that would be on the books would likely be, try to be slightly less prescriptive. Um, and just a quick note that, you know, there's a version of TOPA that was introduced at the federal level by Rep. Omar um, in her Emergency Rent and Mortgage Cancellation Act. And even though that bill didn't move forward, I think that the inclusion of that right represented a real awareness of TOPA's relevant for this current moment. Um, you know, it's, its ability to keep speculators out of homes and neighborhoods and expand community owned and controlled housing, particularly when we're seeing tons of housing insecurity and speculation. So if we can move to the next slide. Uh, yeah, just a quick note about just like, who's included and who's not included, mainly because New York State TOPA is statewide. Um, included under TOPA are all counties um, in the state. Single family houses owned by corporate landlords would be covered if passed, um, as well as multifamily housing with two or more units, whether they're owned by private for profit landlords or nonprofit housing providers. Uh, who's not included? Owner occupied single family homes, essentially, you know, the primary occupant would not sell it to themselves. Um, public housing is also exempt, recognizing that it's a kind of social housing. Um, and even if public housing in the city is um, privatized, sometimes the land under the housing is usually retained by the public housing authority. Um, and also not included are our is housing that receives government subsidy, like Section 8 that I mentioned. Um, and the idea there is that they're already required to stay affordable as part of the subsidy program. Also, the, the state is unable to regulate uh, some of the federal affordable housing programs. COPA, on the other hand, only applies to multifamily buildings with three or more units, um, and it's not as prescriptive about some of the exemptions outside of a few obvious ones like eminent domain transfers, for example. Uh, so I'll pass it to Celeste to give a little bit more of an overview. Thanks, Akila. Um, you could just go to the next slide. Um, so I won't go too much into detail on the New York TOPA process as it, as it largely um, follows the DC, DC process that was um, outlined by Ramon. Um, so, and, and I just wanted to add to, to, to that, like, we're, we're, as Akila mentioned, we're building off of the DC model. We're sort of in, in lockstep partnership with, as with the COPA TOPA um, between the, the Berkeley and the, the San Francisco bills as well. Um, but we're also trying to build off the, the rich history, history of limited equity co-ops that exist in New York City. While, while TOPA hasn't existed as a right, there's almost 40,000 units of limited equity co-ops. Um, in, in New York City, and, and they kind of have their own trajectory and history and, and regulatory scheme. Um, so there is a need to kind of be reflective of that uh, to, to make sure that we, we learn from our own lessons as well. Um, so just a, a couple of a couple of things to highlight as differences, and this, this slide's a, a little difficult to, to take in at once. Um, the timelines roughly match the, the timelines in DC. Um, with some slight differences in what sort of occurs in each stage of the process. Um, I, I would add as, as a difference as well, and I think Akila mentioned this, that there, there is an explicit definition in the bill of, of what it means to be a supportive partner and a qualified purchaser, um, and it includes the instruction to the state to um, release an RFP and to qualify um, certain groups as, as supportive partners and qualified partners and to, after that process, publicize the list. Um, so that they're available to, to tenants. Um, it also requires in the period where the formation of the tenant organization takes place for the for the uh, tenant association to select a supportive partner and have that uh, support throughout the process. Um, in addition, just wanted to highlight um, that unlike the DC bill, tenants cannot sell their TOPA rights um, and they're, they're limited in the affordability of the, the buildings that are created. Um, there, there isn't um, a right to convert to a market rate co-op, but uh, permanent affordability is actually a requirement of the program that will be enforced either through partnership with a community land trust um, or through a restricted covenant if there isn't a community land trust um, in the area that can, that can work with, with the tenants in the building or the qualified partner. Um, Additionally, 
Um, I just wanted to, to I mean, we, as, as the DC uh, folks mentioned, um, the, the single family homes are included um, in, our, in our TOPA bill, but uh, not obviously the owner occupied units, um, which, which is largely based to, I think, on something I wanna highlight, which is that this is a, a statewide um, piece of legislation. Uh, and so it has to be reflective of, of very different markets. Obviously the market in central Brooklyn is a little bit different than what's happening in Binghamton or Kingston. Um, so there's a need to kind of meet both of those um, realities um, so that tenants can, can properly exercise these rights. So I think if we go to the next slide, just sort of wanted to reiterate the, the pillars. Um, and I think to, to bring this back to to um, to the moment that we're in right now um, in the in the beginning of the recovery from the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, this is a moment of like extreme precarity for tenants, um, but a moment of enormous opportunity for real estate investors. Um, and so these are the moments when letting standard market rate transactions continue unchecked and unabated um, could catapult us even further into long term crisis in terms of affordability and homelessness. Um, given the, the power dynamic that exists um, between tenants and real estate um, and the sort of obvious resource imbalance that exists between those groups. Um, so we need mechanisms right now that will create a just recovery, um, ones that stabilize distressed buildings and that grow our, our social housing um, stock uh, so that we can finally move forward um, from a state of perpetual housing crises um, due to that sort of dynamic of the imbalance of power. I think we move to the last slide. Yeah. Um, so, as we mentioned, um, these are not uh, yet passed legislations, um, past bills, and um, we are really thinking about the program that's being uh, created um, around le the legislation itself and what we need essentially um, and has been discussed by DC panelists as well, um, our money, time, and tenant power, um, money for resident organizing, technical assistance, as well as uh, the, the pre-development, development, and rehab costs um, that was previously mentioned. We need time, uh, you know, if we're competing against all cash offers in some senses, um, we need time for groups to organize, and we need time to obtain proper financing. Um, and we need tenant power. We need tenants to, to really understand their rights and be able to, to exert some agency over where they live um, and be able to partner with community groups when they decide that that's the most appropriate solution. Um, Edward, uh, who's also on the panel, will speak, uh, I believe, about the tenant power side. Um, but we just wanted to hone in on these three key pieces that makes TOPA uh, really work. I don't know if Celeste wanted to add anything there. No, I think that's great. I think it's a it, just one thing to note is, is as Akila mentioned in um, the beginning of the presentation, that a lot of this work is being done through two coalitions: the Housing Justice for All, which is a, a statewide coalition of of um, tenant uh, organizations and and homelessness organizations, and and Nicely, which is um, fighting for community land trust in New York City and Northwest Bronx, is a, a part of both of those coalitions that we've been trying to. To work in, in, in lockstep on, on both fronts. I just wanted to say that before passing it off to Edward. Awesome. Thank you. So, with that overview um, of the New York TOPA and COPA proposals, uh, we're going to close out the New York segment um, by taking it to the Bronx uh, with Edward Garcia, the Director of Community Development um, at Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition who is leading tenant and community organizing efforts for COPA and TOPA, um, as well as development without displacement through community stewardship of land and housing. Great. Um, can you hear me well? Yep, we can hear you. Cool, cool. So my name is Edward and I'm uh, technically an organizer. I never really see myself as anything different than an organizer uh, um, with Northwest Bronx Community and Claudia Coalition. And we have been around uh, for a couple of decades now, and we have been organizing around the issues that our members ca uh, mostly care about, and that has been ec economic development, community development, health and justice, safe and affordable housing, um, environmental sustainability, 
and ending the school to prison pipeline and education justice. We can go to the next slide, please. So I'm just going to share some of our values because I think this is really important to kind of understand uh, how Northwest Bronx operates. Oops. Sorry, Edward, it looks like the uh, the text didn't tr uh, translate over, but I'll work on that while you start sharing. No worries, no worries. Um, that some of our values are that uh, we, are, we consider ourselves a member-driven member organization, so technically uh, our members uh, are the ones that are at the forefront and deciding uh, the shape of our organizing work. And that uh, those directly impacted should be the ones also at the decision table. And we're actually committed to shifting the power structure and building collective power. And we do this work because we love our community and we, are, are, we value pride and dignity and that believe that the diversity of our community should be celebrated and it's a strength. And I just wanted to share some context to understand some of the things that the Bronx has already been going on before COVID. Uh, so if you can get to that slide, I think that uh, hopefully captures the text. Uh, but Northwest Bronx, uh, the Bronx is actually 62 out of 62 uh, in worse health outcomes across New York State. So it was not a coincidence to have the Bronx had one of the highest death rates uh, of COVID across the country. Uh, and that because of already high displacement pressures, uh, we have had an affordability crisis uh, and many of our tenants continue to be harassed and displaced by, uh, by landlords who have no other intentions but making profits in our community. Uh, and, and things like rezonings and other development projects have made, uh, have added to the gentrification, uh, push and incentivizing landlords to harass and evict low income residents uh, and commercial tenants as well with nowhere to go. And though we have had a lot of, if we can go to the next slide, though we have had a lot of very successful organizing uh, throughout our years, and we actually value the importance of fighting, fighting back. There you go. Okay. Um, we said fighting back is just not enough, right? Fighting for uh, closing loopholes and pushing um, for more legislations that will uh, penalize landlords for not providing adequate service was just not enough. Over time, over the four decades, our members continue to be displaced and are as poor as we were 40 years ago. And we went through a, a planning series in which we said, we, needed to, we need to take a different shift. And fighting back is not enough. We need to start thinking about uh, strategies that are fighting forward in which we're actually implementing and suggesting new mechanisms that work for our people. So if we can get to the next slide. So, uh, and that's how uh, Northwest Bronx started to do work around community land trust, right? And also with the understanding that fighting back is important, right? Because we can be fighting for uh, more collective ownership and governance, but while people are already in court, right? While people are already living in really bad uh, conditions, right? So we needed to uh, have a balance and ensure that like, as we're protecting our community members now, we're also needing to think of additional strategies that will help us um, protect and control our community over the long term. Uh, and so we have been doing a lot of work to shift uh, or organizing to ensure that uh, we are uh, also prioritizing um, uh, organizing campaigns that are uh, helping to expand collective ownership and governance uh, for work. So this is just a few snapshots. Some of the organizing we have been doing, such as holding workshops on what a community land trust is, understanding uh, our community. It, you'll be surprised, but New York City doesn't even have a count of all the vacant uh, or abandoned parcels. Like mostly, the community knows what they are. And we have trusted and our members have trusted uh, ourselves to be able to gather that information. So if we can go to the next slide, please. I just wanted to give you a sense of uh, a, a story that I think uh, was really impactful to me as an organizer. Uh, actually, I have that slide first. So just to uh, give you an idea, we actually launched a campaign for community control. I wanted to share some of our principles that we came up with our campaign because our, since our campaign is uh, uh, mostly on 
we can actually go back to the um, principles. Since our campaign is actually on public land, I just wanted to just briefly show the principles and, and not necessarily focus on uh, demand since they're mostly on public land. But that development in the Bronx should be accountable to the uh, to uh, the people of the Bronx. I'm gonna look at the slides here because for some reason it keeps changing my screen. Uh, and that land in the in the Bronx belongs in the hands of Bronx residents, not outside interest. And we have seen so many times how the city and private developers continues to uh, introduce and implement plans without including community input. And the community planning and envisioning must take precedence over corporate profit. And connect and, and that community ownership and collective governance is the path to sustainable and truly affordable neighborhoods. Uh, and I just wanted to talk about this organizing campaign that I actually organized myself uh, back in 2016. This is a, a building that I organized in the uh, in the north uh, in the north Bronx is 2076 Creston. And and to me, uh, this has been a very impactful uh, organizing story to see. If we would have had something like a top and Copa in New York City, this would have made a significant difference. If we can go to the next slide, please. I think there's a lag, Sarah. So go to the, the Creston slide. Maybe I can turn off my camera. I don't know if it's me. So I, I helped to organize this building back in 2016. The conditions were no, the tenants had no cooking gas, uh, insufficient heat and hot water. The building was infested of rats and, and, and other pests. Uh, the, the doors were broken. Uh, there were like all kinds of also lack of conditions, lack of uh, access to repairs. And actually also an entire line had a vacant order. Uh, and, you know, that's a whole conversation on how many landlords in New York City profit out of fires and vacant orders in the city of New York. Uh, and the tenants organized, we built a very successful uh, uh, leadership team. We did all kinds of actions. We filed rent reductions with the state. We held public actions and, and, and brought on uh, the press and elected officials. I filed uh, cases with the uh, with housing court in the Bronx. We filed also a warrant of habitability case to try to cover for damage caused by not having gas over almost 18 months. Uh, and at that moment, you know, like we also asked ourselves this question, right? We should actually be the ones owning this building. The tenants should. Uh, an owner who has exposed uh, that residents to be in this condition should not be allowed to even own in a city, uh, in any city in, in, the, in, in the country, right? So we all the pressure, the landlord actually decided to sell in late 2016, right? Organizing began uh, early 20, uh, 2016. And the, this, this current owner at the time bought the building in 2014 for $4.6 million. I ended up selling it for in 2016 for 4.62 million dollars in a two-year expand with, with all of these existing conditions right and eventually what happened the new owner uh made uh slow the process in terms of the courts not being clear on who she actually uh the new the filed uh, paperwork should go to uh, the new owner came in also claiming that residents uh, had a uh, back rent uh, oh back rent from from files that the previous owner had had shared. Uh, eventually that watered down the organizing. Uh, and this this current owner ended up displacing more than a dozen families and converted uh, mo many of those uh, empty units to cluster sites, giving giving those units at a super high prices to uh, uh, folks who are coming direct directly from shelters, but where that did not also have access to a permanent lease, right? So they were there, but they couldn't guarantee that they will be there in the future. We also made it made it super complicated to engage them in the organizing. And we have seen, so if you actually look at the pictures on the left, the picture on the bottom right, this collapse just happened one year and a half ago. Uh, and so this shows that you had a new acquisition and the, 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 the existing Baker order in 2016 was also a collapse that happened and they shut down an entire line. This actually happened on the first floor. So maybe that didn't ignite an entire uh, line collapse, uh, sorry, uh, Baker order. But you can see that uh, not having legislations like Topa and Copa continues to uh, allow for landlords who have no interest in keeping uh, our community safe in protecting our community members who were here when nobody wanted to be in the Bronx, right? Because I think 
uh, many uh, consider the Bronx as, as a place where you didn't want to grow, uh, grow up with your children and, and many uh, who had the opportunity and the privilege left and the people of the Bronx stayed, rebuilt the Bronx uh, and continue to celebrate its diversity. And you can, uh, and we continue to have, ha 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 having investors coming into our neighborhoods to uh, be able to maximize their profit uh, and not invest in our communities. And I just wanted to share uh, some of my takeaways uh, in the next slide. Uh, and that I think that Topa and Copa will not be successful without organizing, right? Because I think you can have plenty of time. Uh, and for those who understand tenant organizing, building a tenant association takes time, right? And like this will work with a strong, with a strong plan uh, to support the organizing. And in fact, I actually think that, for example, right now, it will mostly support buildings that are already organized, right? So this will actually be super more accessible to the tenants who already have built leadership systems, who have already been engaged, are connected to a community-based organization. And I actually think that Topa and Copa will, will strengthen the tenant movement in New York um, uh, because I think uh, for, for far too long, uh, we have been conditioned to think that fighting for ownership, it's not uh, a possibility. Uh, and that um, uh, we should be fighting uh, for better living conditions, which actually should have been uh, like a given. Uh, so hope, hopefully, uh, I, my assessment is that uh, Topa and Copa will strengthen the tenant movement and also will, will help expand social housing models, such as community lunches. So in the next slide, uh, I, did, I did see someone ask on the chat about contact information. Uh, it's my uh, email or where you can get in contact with me. I'll pass it back to Julia. Thank you so much. And yes, uh, several folks have been asking for contact information. So we'll share the slide deck um, contact info on the recording um, for everyone after the presentation as well. Um, so I know we have a lot of questions uh, for discussion in the chat, but I think also, um, Edward, given some of your comments, there's a few questions about um, uh, education and organizing for tenants for, for I think both New York and DC. Um, so for us, for DC folks, um, in your case, who does the tenant education and organizing? Um, and how long um, in your experience does it take to educate and organize tenants to the point where they can take action? So now Fernando, if you want to take that one first. Well, I think it's, I think it's that taken for the big is, uh, I have several, several times. You have to continue doing education to the tenants because also they have to understand what is the process. They have to understand the, 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 the uh, not only the process, you know, how that impact then and what is the result. So the education and the organizing is all not only take it at the beginning, that's the first step, but the, it's the continual education until they they realize that they own the building and what uh, what af, uh, happened after they own the building as well. So they, the education is is a long process and is taken in several uh, several stages, not only at the beginning, you know, over the years, and and that's taken because a development process with a uh, tenants association is not a short period of time. Because first you have the organizing, the understanding what how do you can own the, the buildings, then the purchase. Then the renovation, then the permanent financing, and then the the continual education. So it's a long process, and 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 at the same time, their lives change, and they some some of their life being impacted for for different situations that you have to retrain the newcomers or retrain the new member of the co the the new member of the tenants association of co op. And the, the District of Columbia um, funds several community based organizations that are all nonprofits to do right. this for, for free. So we have um, nonprofits in every um, quadrant of the city and we have um, we have and you can any any resident of the District of Columbia can access them for any number of reasons, but they specifically go into the tenant purchase process and are part of not only helping to educate the um, tenants who are figuring out what they want to do, but they also see themselves because they are um, a service that is provided to the tenants. They are firmly positioned as that they don't represent anybody else. And the, um, 
the work that they do is to help the folks who live in that building make the best decision for themselves about what the outcome should be and then support them going forward and they help them build their development team. They help them figure out all of the different things that they need to figure out about how to get their project through the process and then they can stay with them afterwards and do post purchase pre crisis counseling, which is also very important. Um, and there's a couple questions kind of related to some of the challenges um, or perhaps pitfalls for TOPA. Um, so where have you seen TOPA maybe fall short of its mission um, and what can be done about that um, is one question. And then I know there was a similar one um, in the Q&A for DC folks as well. And um, if you could talk about challenges and realities of some of the TOPA outcomes, um, including the double green courts as one prime example. Well, I think, um, I think there's, you know, anybody who listens to classic rock knows that like the best groups sometimes break up and you are dealing with people and groups of people. Um, and so, um, you know, that is group dynamics are always challenging to sustain over a long period of time. Um, that is really 1 of those features where it's the art of tenant organizing that I think, you know, that Edward was talking about and Fernando was referencing as well. Um, and there's also the, the structural piece, um, the, the buildings, you know, are ch a challenge themselves and. You know, so, so if your template is, if your canvas is this. Is this building that you don't know fully know all the details about, and it has been through 50 years of uh, modification, you know, there can be challenges there as well. Um, so, you know, that those are some issues that are that that I think is embedded in the way that Mikasa does its work, frankly, which is like go in there, do a deep renovation that's going to be worth that's going to sustain itself for 40 years. So you could do a topa process where you're just buying the building, but the goal is to buy it and do a deep renovation that actually doesn't need to be revisited so that the residents can focus on managing an asset that's going to you know, be fairly stable so that they can focus on, you know, um, occupy, keeping people living there, you know, managing the property management and so forth and not having to, to do some kind of wacky unexpected repair within three years. Anya, I don't know if you want to chime into that question as well. Um, so. It's funny, I, I the co-op that I live in is called the Friendly Neighbors Cooperative. And <laughs> the reason it's called that is because, like I said, it was 70% senior citizen when I moved in and they had all known each other for a really long time and were working cooperatively on running the building, even though it was a rental then. Um, and one of the ground rules that they set through the process was we are going to maintain our friendliness because I was really candid with them. I had worked on other tenant purchases there's a moment where people, you know, there's a lot of stuff to take in. It's a difficult process. It's not easy, but it it is worthwhile and you got to try to keep everybody together. And there are points where people do kind of want to fall out with each other. And they kind of made this very um, smart decision as only seniors can and kind of looked everybody in the eye and said, we're not going to fall out with each other over this. We're going to be friendly. We're going to maintain our friendships. And I have to say it is one of the smoother tenant purchases that I worked on. But I mean, the thing that is essential to this process is there's got to be a moment where you just decide you're going to take that leap of faith. And I think the effective um, teams are the ones that are honest with people about what the expectations are, about how to achieve this. And I have been to meetings where Fernando has said, very frankly, this is a difficult project, but it's one we know we can do. And so I think that a big part of the process is maintaining the, um, making sure that everybody's staying honest with each other, but also, um, as I said at the start, there's gotta be that intention from the very beginning of what it is that you wanna do. And I think if you keep checking in with pe people throughout the process on, is this the, the project that we envision? Is this the thing that we wanna do? What does a win look like in this? Um, you know, when you say you want everybody to make it to the finish line, what does that mean? There's a lot of uh, sort of diving in deeper and making people connect with each other. 
And then there is, I think, as a direct result of the way that the law is structured, um, sort of hinging on the basic right, there's a huge, huge swing of creativity that then happens to address the wide variety of issues that come up. So if you find out that, you know, half the building is a uh, very, very low income and the other half of the building is not, you can adjust what the model looks like. If you find out that there are a bunch of people who have help that are helping them get through the process, but there's a bunch of people who don't, we can, you know, shore that up by offering more assistance to the people who don't have help. There are a lot of different ways to correct for what's going on, but it requires off the break, I think, for your intentionality to be that this is going to be a project that we get everybody through and we get them through in a specific way. You have to have, you have to keep having those conversations. And I think the city's responsibility in that is providing all of the tools that people need. So it is important for us to fund community based organizations that can go in and provide expertise. To, to tenants so that they don't have to worry about how they're going to pay for that. It is also coming up with some of the first dollars in to help people acquire property. And it's and it's deciding that as a city, we value affordable housing. So when they come back 30 years later and they need to figure out how to um, reposition the building, we can we can come back and and add some more of our cash to help them stay in community and continue to maintain the way that they're living. One other thing. Can I, one of the key things that, that uh, Tanya was in, in the moment was common. Uh, a lot of our uh, members of the community are not backable. They cannot, they cannot go and secure financing for themselves. So the, the TOPA is a tool for them to give it that, that uh, possibility to own something on the long range and control something in the neighborhood. That is a, is, a, is, a, is a key component during the process of educating the tenants about the right and the options. Um, so another question, um, what are the arguments um, that are kind of coming up against COPA and TOPA um, and how have you all responded to those? Maybe we can start um, with New York folks first and then, and then go to DC. That's a very broad question. <laughs> um, I think some of the arguments, opposition that we've been seeing have have been coming up, not just with New York, but across the country with some proposals, but also just when anything tries to move uh, uh, the market into more responsible ownership and into more social ownership, you know, like you're slowing down the market, you're infringing on owner's rights, um, you know, the, 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 the timelines, and D I know DC can speak about this, like the timelines are too long and you're infringing on a private owner's rights to do what they want with their property. And to that, and please other panelists weigh in here, you know, at the end of the day, this is still, TOLPA is still very much a market transaction. You're matching uh the 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 offer that's put on the table um you're not diminishing the cost or the value that has been um held to be the price of the property um but you're recognizing that communities cannot just continue to be displaced and continue to be a pawn in the process when the playing field is not level right now, right? The, 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 if, if they're competing, if tenants, residents, communities are competing against all cash offers, there needs to be some leveling mechanism um, that stops a lot of the hyper speculation operating within the market, but recognizing that imbalance. Um, and so that infringement of of or diminishing of value is is not there. It's just an, it's a leveling of the playing field. Others can respond um, to I that. And I, mm -hmm. One thing before passing it to the DC folks because I think they have a, a lot of um, experience sort of responding to these these things. But I I was just going to say that it's so helpful um, it, for our organizing in New York that this legislation exists in very similar form in DC. I think particularly. I think the real estate industry is um, fairly powerful across the country, but particularly in New York City, um, 
Revney and, and a lot of the, the landlord lobby groups have a significant amount of power. So I think being able to point to a system um, like DC where this works, where as Akila said, it's still like a market-based transaction and it, it, it slows the process down somewhat and allows tenants to assert their rights, but um, hasn't like collapsed the real estate market in DC, right? So I think, um, I think it allows us a, a real rebuttal to that pretty like um, hyperbolic talking point that I think will, will likely come as we move like further along in this process. I think that um, the sort of the siren, the, what the siren song of the NIMBY is, what about, what about our property values? What about, you know, there's always a what about that has to do with trying to shut um, affordability down. And what we have found, um, because we have had this tool for so long, is that none of those arguments hold any water. So it did, doesn't it doesn't cool the market. It doesn't create a problem. It doesn't it doesn't do much of anything except empower people who are already living in the building to take control of their own destiny. And uh, a lot of the argument that we heard from the private sector had to do with sort of unfair taking. But because the tenants have to meet an existing offer, there's no argument there. You're still going to get the same amount of money that you were going to get before. They also complain about the timeline. And my thing is, you know, I actually have worked for a for profit um, real estate developer, and I know that there are complex deals out there that take some time. And that, that's this is the same thing. So the thing that I learned working in the for profit side is that what developers want is certainty. And our TOPA law provides that certainty. You know what the timelines are, you know what the benchmarks are, you know what your requirement is, so live up to that. And people get dinged all the time um, because of how robust our system is for um, sending the notices incorrectly. They'll send them in one language. Um, they will send them, they won't deliver them to every single unit. They won't, you know, they, there's a whole bunch of different things that, that people shoot themselves in the foot by not following the statute. So we have a lot of people who have ramped up to that. They know exactly what the law is. They know how to follow it. I think the problem that we're facing has to do with the assignment of rights. And, um, we started with a market that was severely depressed as Ramon said. Um, it was created at a time when we were losing population and people were abandoning the city. Um, the reason that Chocolate City happened for a lot of, um, for all intents and purposes in DC is because of white flight. And we had all black leadership that said, we got to figure out how to take control of this. We implemented something that would help poorer people. And that really um, was fine at first. When we started to experience out of control gentrification, that's when the assignment of rights stuff started to be a problem. And I think that's the only thing, you know, when we have people walking through and developers walking through offering cash offers um, to people who are then gonna have to turn around and be in the same market and not be able to get the same amount for that money. That's the problem. And we have really shored up our nonprofit systems to be able to deal with that better. Um, but I think overall, the way that it works as a tool, because it's been around for so long, because people know what it is, they're able to negotiate um, both on the personal side and on the professional side um, because there there is certainty there. I think we'll do like one last question before um, closing reflections. So just sort of related to the matching the offer, um, a question: What's to prevent owners from jacking up the price with a sham bid? Call me cynical in parentheses, and then. Maybe relatedly, how can you prevent um, landlords and tenants from negotiating move on agreements privately in anticipation um, of a sale? Well, I think it's in, in our experience, if that happened, the landlord used the top out well to, to, uh, to push the price up. And uh, they, they, they're very speculative. And that's the, that is. Is is a system is uh, and a lot of landlord work in, in conjunction with other people and they speculated and have a contract and then that price enough and get another contract and price enough. That's a that's a situation in the market, you know. And we have to deal with that situation on the regular, um, you know, in many in many opportunities in many cases. Yeah, I think I mean. So a simple thing is that, you know, when you have, when you buy a piece of real estate, you need to get title insurance. And so, I mean, if, 
theoretically, if somebody's paying all cash, they wouldn't maybe net need their title insurance. But if they want to sell the building in the future, they're going to want title insurance. So to get title insurance in DC, you have to pretty much show that you complied with TOPA. So a fraudulent offer would be harder to insure. And I think it would, it would jeopardize the jeopardize the the new buyer's investment. Now, I do think we need to perhaps acknowledge that not all um, real estate investors are rocket scientists and or, you know, um, and so they're, you know, they may people make dumb investments um, that we have to deal with. But, but that that's one of those um, those features that that help. It's a regular. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to add in the the right to an appraisal as well that um, it, it is written into the the New York legislation. I think it exists in some form in the DC legislation as well. So um, tenants, you know, if something seems tenants can exercise the right to have an appraisal um, by a, a professional a, a appraisal and, and like a, a third party and non interested third party um, done, which would which inserts a little bit of rational price setting into um, into the system. There's obviously multiple ways to um, appraise a building's value. Um, so, you know, based on sort of market comparative analysis or, or sort of income based approach um, and, and a capitalization model. So I think it's that this, it's there as a right that I think, like, if something was completely um, out of whack that that it can be exercised, but it, it has its limitations as well to um, based on the, the different methods of appraisal. Um, well, we're coming up on the, the ends of our time here, um, but just wanted to um, invite panelists if you have any last sort of closing reflections on um, on the conversation and why um, why these policies are particularly critical um, in this moment and as we consider um, what we need to do for an equitable housing recovery. I mean, the closing thought I would say is that, um, you know, since we have uh, portfolio investments um with a number of organizations and some permanent investments i mean when the pandemic hit we really anticipated that our portfolio um was going to start seeing you know distress immediately you know like in Mar in april or may a year ago we thought this would happen right and then we asked and spoke to people and because the rents were set affordable for the completed projects you know, those projects were very, these investments were very resilient, whether they were a cooperative or a topo, which had assigned it to a nonprofit owner or, or affordable owner. So I do think that um, one thing we've learned is that, you know, affordable housing, when it's properly financed, is resilient, not just from a financial standpoint, but, you know, neighbors helping each other, neighbors looking out for each other, people figuring out how to share Wi Fi. Um, and sharing information now about rental assistance and vaccines and everything else. So um, there's there's embedded value that is that extends well beyond the initial purchase and the four walls and and the affordability with the buildings. I totally agree with you. Thanks. Any New Yorkers want to chime in? I don't know. Edward, maybe. Okay. Um, well, if not, um, we just want to thank again all of our panelists um, and everyone for joining uh, for this conversation. And I know there's um, some questions that we didn't get to, so we can share those. Um, with panelists as well um, after um, and, and collect some answers between us. Um, and as I said, we'll we'll send out the link to the recording um, and some of the other resources shared on the call. Um, and thank you all again so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.